morning and welcome to Charleston Baptist Church. We are so glad you are worshiping with us today. At this time, we ask that you direct your attention to the video screens for this week's highlighted announcements. This month's mission and prayer focus is Love God, Serve. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each of you has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. How will you or your life group serve this month? There are many ministry opportunities to serve, whether on campus or outside the campus of 13 San Miguel Road. If you need some ideas as to where or how to serve, please contact Pastor Jason. That's Jason at charlestonbaptist.org. And as you serve, we invite you to post some pictures on social media as an encouragement to others. As you post, be sure to use hashtag LoveGodServe2024. That's hashtag LoveGodServe2024. The Seasons Ladies Ministry is hosting an event on Saturday, April 20th at 10 a.m. The theme is The Power of Prayer. A light brunch will be served. Ladies of all ages and in all seasons of life are welcome to attend. If you plan to attend, we ask that you please register online. You can find the registration link on the Next Steps page of the church website. And once again, we welcome you to Charleston Baptist Church. If you are a first time guest, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to stop by the Next Steps desk in the main lobby after the service so that we can meet you and give you a welcome gift. And that is all of our highlighted announcements this week. Our worship service will begin shortly. We hope you have a blessed week and pray that we will see you again next Sunday, if not before.
Well, good morning, church family. It's good to be with you this morning to join our hearts for worship. Let's stand together as we are going to sing in this first song. There is joy in the house of the Lord this morning. So let's lift our voices as we worship to him. Sing it again. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Thank you. 
this precious time of worship today. Lord, I pray as we sing, it will just be from our hearts. And Lord, that all of us done in this place today is just honoring you. We thank you in the midst of all that you're doing. We ask you to continue to move. And we pray in your name. I count on one to be the same God that never fails. You will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your I count on one year, the same God that never fails, you will not fail me now, you won't fail me now in the way, the same God who's never failed, is working all things out, you're working all things out, yeah. Good morning. I'm Jason Davis. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Charleston Baptist. Uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, we do have a few announcements uh, for us this morning. Uh, a reminder about April. April, our mission and prayer focus for the month of April is love God, serve. And you might wonder, what does that mean? Well, it's based off of 1 Peter 4.10. It says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That each one of us, by God's grace, has, has been in a, given a gift, whether there's one gift or many gifts. Uh, but that gift is not used to build our own kingdom, but it's to be used to build the kingdom of God. So we are called to do that as a church body. 
And one of the things we like to do is serve together. One of the things that I have learned over the years is that serving is not just a, a requirement, a duty, something that we've been called to, but it's something that we get to do, that we get to be a part of. So I want to encourage you this month to look for opportunities uh, to, to serve the community, whether it's serving uh, the local church here or whether it's serving at a, another place, another community, uh, in your own home, in your workforce, but that we have as, as believers in Christ, we've been called to serve because Christ served. He came and he served us and he gave his life as a ransom. And so we are, are two to serve. If you have any questions, you, you want to talk more about that, I'd love to talk with you more. Uh, you can email me. Um, you can um, meet me in the front uh, after the service. And we can talk more about that. But also we have one more announcement. Uh, Low Country Fellowship of Christian Athletes is hosting, uh, we are going to be hosting an all-ability sports camp. Uh, so we're really excited to be, have the opportunity to, to host this camp uh, through uh, FCA, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And this is going to be from ages 6 to 21 are the ages that are able to participate. So if you know somebody uh, in, that would uh, benefit or would enjoy participating in this um in this type of camp we'd love for you to be a part of that but also we'll need a lot of volunteers we'll need our church family to come alongside uh the fca uh program the all sport all ability sports camp and and to serve and be a, a great host and show great hospitality to all the the families and all the participants a part of this so we'd love for you to join in on that uh, you can go to our next step link uh, and you can see the different uh, ways to participate there uh, let's go to the lord in prayer father as we enter into uh, a time of offering Father, I, I thank you for allowing us to be here to worship together. Lord, you are so good and, and gracious to us to have gifted each one of us with some gift. And some have many gifts and some have just a very few. But that we are grateful for the things that you have blessed us with. And that we use those, those gifts to glorify your name, to build your kingdom, to serve others. Father, I pray that we would seek for opportunities to do that uh, this month and the months to come. Father, I also pray for this FCA um, All Ability Sports Camp that's coming up in June. Uh, Lord, that as it, it, it is approaching, Father, that we be praying for the participants uh, that will be uh, involved with it. Father, we would also look for opportunities that we could serve at it and how joyous it is to serve how much of a blessing it is to others and to us and to our soul to be able to serve and care and love for others. Father, I thank you for uh, Pastor Kevin. I thank you for his willingness to preach your word. Father, I pray, Lord, as he comes and preaches your word, may we have the ears to hear. And Lord, you would bless the preaching of your word and the singing and praise to you as we sing in unity to you. And Father, as we give, Lord, that we would give with an open hand, a cheerful heart. Lord, a disposition knowing that you are so gracious and, and generous to us that we can be a blessing to others around us. And we don't have to hoard anything to ourselves, but that we have you. And that is sufficient. That is enough. Father, I thank you for your grace in my life and the life of this church. Lord, help us to be a generous, loving, and caring, and serving people. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
the dawn of resurrection floods the night as hope prevails to shine salvation waits our chains to break and we Praise the Lord. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you for joining with us on campus and online. Uh, as we enter a time of just uh, spending time in God's word, I want to remind us to be praying for our students as they'll be returning from uh, Extreme Weekend. In just a few hours, they'll be back on campus and just praising the Lord. Uh, a young lady in our student ministry a, a few weeks ago received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And just this weekend, she followed through in obedience by being baptized in the ocean. And so I'm very, very thankful for that. Yes, praise the Lord. Yeah. Uh, as we turn our attention to the word of the Lord this morning, I, I want to uh, spend just a moment praying 
Uh, part of that prayer will be just preparing us to uh, hear and respond to the word of the Lord, and, and the other part of that prayer will just be uh, just being reminded of uh, how amazing uh, God has united, knitted the community of faith together uh, to pray for one another when we are going through our highs and lows of life, and to be reminded that our God is a global God, and he has, by his grace, he has sent out many uh, from our church, our own, our, from our church family, uh, to minister the gospel in foreign lands. And so we want to take a moment just to pray over that before we turn to the word of the Lord. So if you would, join with me in prayer. Uh, Lord, as we just come uh, to this time of uh, preparing and being ready to hear from you, uh, Lord, we do so thankful uh, for the finished work of Christ uh, that is given to us in the message of the gospel. Uh, Lord, this morning, uh, we want to think about those who are uh, serving in different parts of the world. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for technology, uh, to be able to communicate back and forth uh, through text messages, phone calls, emails. Uh, think about our brother in Ecuador, um, our brother and sister in, in India, uh, Lord, our brother in uh, West Africa. And just this morning, uh, a dear brother in the Lord who's uh, currently serving uh, from our church family in Israel and just all that is happening uh, overnight uh, specifically there and just being able to to reach out to him this morning and to get a response back uh, saying that he's okay and uh, Lord what a blessing it is to know that in the midst of great adversary God you are good and you are gracious and your gospel message will not be thwarted I pray as a church family we'd be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ those that we know and those that we don't know who are serving uh, locally and globally. Uh, Lord, we think about those who are in, our, in the military, uh, serving in D.C. and Turkey and everywhere in between. Lord, just th the ability through technology to continue to love on them, to encourage them, to support them, and, and their families who are uh, uh, possibly still local uh, as they're serving abroad. Uh, Lord, let us love uh, well, and Lord, thank you for a church that does that uh, well through your spirit. Lord, as we turn our attention to the word, uh, Lord, let it, let it be an encouragement to us. Let it challenge us, uh, rebuke us, correct us, restore us, because that is what the word of the Lord does. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. If you would open your Bibles to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're going to continue our, our study through this amazing book. Uh, um, uh, the title of our messages have been surrounded around the theme, the search for meaning, the search for meaning. If you're joining with us on campus and you do not have a copy of God's word, I'd encourage you to look underneath the seat in front of you or underneath the seat that you're sitting in. There should be a blue Bible there. I would encourage you to take that Bible, open up to page 619, 619. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon has been taking us on uh, several test drives, if you will, the, set, the test drives of life, and he's uh, been going down different paths, uh, and he's been reminding us all throughout our messages that if you're uh, going to enter into the test drives of life that that center around you and not the glory of the Lord, no matter what path you choose to take, that path will always end with vanity, right? So the search for meaning is not found in the things of this world, but it's found only in a relationship with our Lord through the work of Jesus Christ. Last week, Solomon took us down the path of worshiping God, the importance of rightly worshiping the Lord and how that brings about meaning and purpose in our life. And it's in those first seven verses in Ecclesiastes 5 that we, we are reminded that true worship of God uh, requires uh, sincerity. There's a, a genuineness, an authenticity to our worship. And that worship also requires humility. Remember, uh, he, he is God and we are just of the earth, right? Like he, he is far greater than we. And then there's an integrity to it, that we are to be people of our, we're part of our worship is to be people of integrity. And ultimately, our worship is driven by our fear of the Lord. The fact that we stand in awe of him, that we desire to honor him, that, that we desire to do nothing that brings dishonor to the character of our God. And it's through that that Solomon takes us down a different path uh, this morning, and that uh, the path of money or materialism or possessions or wealth. Solomon, the wealthiest man probably to ever live, shows us through our passage this morning the seductive nature of money. And, and the reality is it doesn't take a whole lot to be seduced, right? And so the important part I want us to be reminded of is don't check out because you don't think you're wealthy. 
but according to the standards of the world, every single one of us has great wealth, possession-wise. And so it's important for us to not check out, but Solomon is addressing the seductive nature of what money uh, can lure us into. In other words, if we choose to go down the path of trying to find meaning in materialism, possessions, wealth, money, guess what? It's always going to be a disappointment. It's always going to be vanity. Uh, And so as I read our passage this morning, I pray that the, the Lord will open our eyes to the importance of having a right posture towards the possessions that God uh, gives to us. Uh, beginning in verse 8, all the way through 20, the scripture says this, If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivating fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil." Just as he came, so shall he go, and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given to him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is a gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. As we unpack our verses this morning, there are two important observations that we want to take away from this passage uh, and and, uh, begin to apply it in our life as it pertains to money, uh, wealth, materialism, however you want to define it. Uh, The first observation that we see this morning is the misery of greed, the misery of greed. In your life, when you choose to make something or someone else the central focus of your life, if it be sex, substance, sports, in this case money, instead of God, misery will be the end result, right? And that's what Solomon begins to unpack for us. Now the question is, why is that? Well, Jesus himself said in the great sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The worship of God and the worship of money, that idol, whatever that idol is, and in this case, money, possessions, materialism, wealth, guess what happens? They are competing agendas. They are not on the same team. They aren't going on the same path. One path leads to life, the other path leads to destruction. And when you choose to make money or wealth your idol, then greed will be the posture of your heart. And when greed is the posture of your heart, misery begins to follow. Solomon talks about the misery of oppression and injustice in those first two verses, 8 and 9. He says, if you see in a province, in a land, in a nation, in an empire, the oppression of the poor... The word oppression is a deep word. We saw that before in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, this idea of the crushing weight of deceiving, defrauding, robbing, and taking advantage of those who are weaker than you. And the violation of justice and righteousness, and that, that word violation talks about something that is violent, a violent perversion of what is right and good. Do not be amazed. That word amazed means don't be startled, don't be afraid at the matter. That word matter is important because it ties us all the way back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. It's the same word that Solomon uses to talk about how God has a divine purpose in everything. There's an appointed time for everything and that divine purpose is what is governed by his sovereign authority. 
The scripture goes on to say, for the high official, those who are in power, those who are in charge, is watched by a higher, and they are yet higher ones over them. In other words, in a world full of great com- corruption, there is corruption to the highest level, right? Where the wicked scratch the backs of the wicked and pad the pockets of the wicked, right? Is that not true of today? That's exactly what we're seeing in life under the sun. He goes on to say in verse 9, But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. So unlike the evil leadership that we see in verse 8, we see good leadership, good, a good king in verse 9 who is using his land for the benefit of others, right? The picture here in the Old Testament is when the fields were harvested, they, God put provision in the work so that the, a portion of the fields would not be harvested so that those who had need could come to those fields and glean from those those fields, right, so that they would be taken care of. So that's the picture that's being painted here. So you can see when greed is man's idol, the misery that follows is what? Oppression and injustice. And when you think about our world, when you have a biblical worldview of what's happening in our lives today, in our nation, in our corporations, in our businesses, and unfortunately in some of our churches, guess what? you see the misery of greed exposing itself in oppression and injustice. But it continues, Solomon continues with the misery of dissatisfaction, not being satisfied with wealth, with money, with material. You mean it's possible to have all the riches of the world and not be satisfied? That's exactly what Solomon is gonna teach us. Ecclesiastes 5.10, he, and the word he, speaks to all of us, right? You know, it's one thing to talk about corrupt government, Right? It's easy to talk about what's happening wrong out there, but is there something wrong with me in here? Right? And so he, he says, yes, he, speaking to all of us, he who loves money, and that's the key, who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income, this also is vanity. So the key word is there that loves money, that has this, uh, this desire, this greedy desire for money. In other words, money talks, right? And it, it does, but it lies, right? It lies. That's what we're finding out. No matter how hard you try, you will never be satisfied when your heart is consumed with money, possessions, or wealth. Money can't buy happiness just like money can't buy true love. Have you learned that in life? And yet somehow, some way, the deceptive nature of money says that we are the exception to the rule, right? We're the exception. We're convinced that if we just had a little bit more, we would be satisfied. And how many of us have taken the test drive down the path of life that gets more and more and more, but there's no satisfaction at all? Why? Because that is the seductive nature of materialism. When greed is your flavor in life, God has hardwired it to where you will never be satisfied, ever. Then Solomon talks about the misery of more expenses. In other words, if you think money is the answer, guess what? You'll find the more you make, the more you spend, right? He says in verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat. The word eat there means consume. So there are those who consume them, and what advantage, what real profit has their owner but to see them with his eyes? In other words, the owner sees the money come and go, right? As the money comes in, the money starts going out. The more you have, the more you spend. The more you have, the more people who come after it. Talk about taxes, bills, insurance, lawsuits, lawyers. What about relatives, right? You start getting a little cheddar in your pocket, guess what? You're going to realize you got a lot of Uncle Ricos and Cousin Eddies that you've never met before, right? And think about that. How, How have you personally used people because they're well off? Do you see, again, the seductive nature It's like you like the guy with the pool, but you don't like the guy himself. You like what he has. Again, this is the foolishness that we get wrapped into. Again, Solomon isn't against wealth. That's important. He's not against wealth. He's not against possessions. He's reminding us that money or wealth doesn't solve problems in our life. In fact, it probably creates more. He talks about the misery of restlessness in verse 12. He says, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. So there's contentment with this gentleman. But the full stomach, 
The one who overindulges of the rich will not let him sleep. In other words, money can't bring you peace of mind. That's what's being told here. The one who believes more and more is the answer only finds themselves to be robbed of the very thing that they're needing, sleep. And if you think about America, the United States of America, just recently, within the past couple years, the lack of sleep is now a public health epidemic in our country. Did you realize that? The lack of sleep is a public health epidemic in our country. In a land, a nation that provides the greatest opportunities to make money and build wealth is suffering from an epidemic of sleep. Should that not be a wake-up call to us? To the church. The cost of overindulgence is literally killing us. Literally killing us. Robbing us. The misery of insecurity, this idea that the more you have, the more secure you'll be. Well, Solomon addresses that as well in verses 13 and 14. He says, there is a grievous, a grievous evil, a sickening evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept, that, that idea of kept means they were being hoarded. They were being hoarded by their owner, so hoarded for themselves. To what? To his hurt. And that word hurt there is, is it, it communicates extreme disaster, extreme pain. And those riches, those riches that were hoarded for self, what does it say? Were lost in a bad adventure. We don't know exactly what the bad adventure was. Uh, maybe it was a, a risky move to acquire more for self. But we know it's gone just like that, right? A bad investment, a gamble, a get-rich-quick scheme. Anybody fall into one of those before? I mean, that's what we see all the time in advertisements. And the scripture says, and he is a father of a son. So he has an heir. But guess what? But he has nothing in his hand. He has nothing to leave behind, right? Because he got wrapped up into this idea that, that wealth is where your true security is found. The very thing he hoarded to provide security, money, possessions, wealth, provided no security at all for himself and for those in his family. Just like that, it was all gone. And that can happen, right? We've experienced that. Some of us who are old enough experienced some of those things to be real estate related or stock market related and not saying that we shouldn't be involved in those types of things i'm just saying that that's not where your security is found right he goes on to talk about the misery of emptiness the misery of emptiness and there's a, a, a build-up that begins in verse 15 he says as he came from his mother's womb he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand so the same way he entered in the world is guess what going to be the same way that he exits the world with nothing of all the funerals that i've had uh, uh, the honor of participating in i've never seen one hearse have a trailer hitch at all right why because when you die guess what you take absolutely nothing with you solomon proposes a question to the person or people who are trying to find fulfillment in selfish greed. In verse 16, he says, this also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? What did it profit for someone to invest their entire lives in things that are temporal and not eternal? What really mattered when you were on the doorstep of eternity? Are you going to look back and say, I wish I had bigger barns? That's what Solomon is trying to address. You see, death unmasks what you truly worshiped while you were alive. That's what you're leaving behind. The true worship that you brought, was it to the Lord or was it to something else? And the misery of greed ends with verse 17. He says, moreover. So in, ind in addition to everything that has already been said, the misery of greed leaves him empty. He says, all his days he eats and darkness. That idea of darkness is a picture of someone is alone with no joy, no satisfaction, also in much vexation, exhausted by all the stresses and strains and frustrations of trying to gain more and more and more, and sickness, being physically worn out, absolutely drained because you thought the answer was greater materialism. And then he ends with anger. The emotional outcome of the greedy pursuit of wealth leads you to a place of enragement and your envy of all the things that you wish you had and you don't have them. This is what life gives 
when you take money, possessions, materialism to be your God. When you choose to worship the almighty dollar and not the almighty God, the misery of oppression, dissatisfaction, more expenses, restlessness, insecurity, and emptiness is your reality. And that's the, the route that Solomon wants to take. That's the, the, that's the path that he experienced and saw for himself. And that's the path, unfortunately, that we have experienced or may be traveling on right now. Is anyone here this morning experiencing the consequences of this type of misery when it comes to greed, materialism, money, wealth, possessions, a false understanding of what truly brings about satisfaction? By the grace of God, there's a better way to live, right? Well, what does the scripture say? And that's the second observation, the joy of God's provisions. The joy of God's provisions. You know, by the grace of God, there's a better way to leverage and to view the possessions that God has given to us. In contrast to the misery of greed, there is joy in God's provision. Up to this point, there's been no mention of God. Have you noticed that? Not one mention of God. But it switches in verse 18 through 20. When our worship of God is right, how we handle and view wealth and possessions will be right. And there's joy to be had in the provisions that God has given to us. One, God gives us the joy of sharing our possessions with others. This is one of the provisions of God's grace that he has given to us. We are to be stewards of the resources and the blessings that he has provided for us. Not just for our own good, but for the good of those around us. Verse 18, he says, behold. In other words, there's, there's an altogether different way to live, right? What I've seen to be good and fitting, and I love that word fitting because it's the same word given back in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, when the scripture says uh, that God makes everything, what? Beautiful in its time. That's the same word. That there is a good and beautiful way to live for the follower of God, right? And what is that beautiful way? Is to eat and drink and find enjoyment. And that's the emphasis in this verse. To find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The days of his life that God has given him, right? Even though it's short, for this is his lot. That word lot talks about God's grace of giving us a gift, a reward of life, right? God has graciously given us all each one of us a specific portion, right? Whether it be in the realm of relationships, education, opportunities, career, wealth, or possessions for the joyful purposes of sharing it with others. Why is it that we were born into this particular land at this particular time? Only God knows that, right? But we are to leverage all those things, our allotment in life for the glory of God and for the good of those around us. This idea of sharing it with others, that's what's pictured here in those phrases, eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil. These are activities that are to be done in fellowship with one another, specifically and especially within the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. God in his grace has given us the capacity to eat and to drink and to work joyfully, sharing our lot in community. We see this over and over again in the early church. One occasion is in Acts 4, verses 33 through 35. The scripture says, and with great power, that word power talks about what the Holy Spirit does, not what man does, but what the Holy Spirit does. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So their focus was where? On the work of Christ, right? And then it goes on to say, and great grace was upon all of them. So not just great power, but great grace. And what did that great power and great grace lead to? It led to what? Great generosity. Verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, they sold them. They were selling off parts of their estate. This, they're not just having a garage sale, right? They're selling off big stuff here, right? And brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed. In other words, it was stewarded out to each as any had need. Man, what an amazing testimony of the work of the Lord. He gives his children provisions to joyfully share with others. When Paul writes to young Timothy, he commands those who had means to share generously with others. In 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 18, he says, they, those who are well off, are to do good. And how so are they to do that? 
uh, to be rich, that is to be overflowing in good works, to be generous and ready to share. This is the direct opposite of the one who's hoarding, right? Who is greedy. This is the direct opposite, right? Thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what, which is truly life. In other words, are you investing in the kingdom of man or the kingdom of God? That's what he's addressing here. And this is an amazing passage of scripture because young Timothy was pastoring a church in Ephesus. And Ephesus was extremely wealthy. And so one of the guardrails that Paul encourages Timothy to command before the people uh, from the idolatry of greed is to do what? To be generous. Generous, not just with resources, but with time. Did you notice that he says, don't, don't just give a lot of money, but man, do a lot of good works, right? Did you see that there? So that's one of the guardrails. As we are led by the Spirit of God, guess what? We can be generous, not only with our resources, but with our time. With our time and how we serve one another. You can see how if we're wrapped up into more and more money and wealth, we, we lose sight of time given in service to one another, right? Think about how important this is for us. We live in a nation that seems to work harder to secure handouts from the government instead of leveraging everything that the Lord has graciously given us for his glory and the good of those around us. I'm not saying that we shouldn't utilize some of those things. Listen, 12 years ago, I went from a over six-figure paying job to $6,000 internship here at Charleston Baptist Church with three kids at the time. And you want to talk about one of the most humbling experiences is going in and getting food stamps and coupon books to provide food for your family. And I say that to say this, there are times when those things are helpful, but the sad reality is when we are greedy and slothful with our time and gifts and talents for the Lord, guess what? We're going to look for handouts and not leveraging everything we have for the glory of the Lord and for the good of those around us. You see what's being sold today. Everybody wants to be entitled to something. We are entitled to, off, to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to the Lord. Why? Because of what he has done in and through our lives. So take every opportunity you have to work, to make money, to be generous, to be a servant. Don't be lazy or negligent with the gifts or resources and time that God has graciously given to you. That's part of your lot, right? That's part of what God has graciously given to you. When we move from truly worshiping the Lord to worshiping the idol of greed, materialism, and wealth, we will lose sight of the joy that God gives us in sharing our provisions that God has provided to us for the betterment of others. And this is why this is important. Because this is not a political issue. This is a gospel issue, right? That, that, this, it's not a political issue ultimately. It is ultimately a gospel issue. John writes in 1 John 3, verses 16 through 18, he says, By this we, talking to believers, we know we, we've experienced the love, the unconditional sacrificial love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to. That word ought is a word of obligation. Based on what Jesus Christ has done for us, there is an obligation to do what? To lay down our lives for our brothers. And what's one of the ways that we do that? He gives us a great illustration in verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods, in other words, they have the means, they have wealth, they have possessions, they have all those things, and sees his brother in need, he sees the need, and yet closes his heart against him. He chooses to harden his heart and not respond graciously and lovingly and sacrificially. How does God's love abide in him? Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. As followers of Christ, we must daily seek God-given opportunities to show love both in truth and in action. And one of the joys that God gives us by his grace through the Spirit is the ability to share what God has given to us with others. One of our families that is serving in India right now has just shared how thankful they are to be a part of a generous church 
that gives them the ability to be where they are, to learn the language, to learn the culture, so that they can focus on the ministry of the gospel and not just trying to make ends meet over and over again. So God be the glory for that. The second joy that we find in our passage is God gives us the power, the ability to enjoy our possessions. That, that is a gift from God, by the way. Look how Solomon says this in verse 19. He says, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. What a beautiful picture of God's grace. God not only gives us uh, the possessions that we have, but he gives us the ability to enjoy those things, right? Again, wealth in and of itself isn't evil. That's important. It's a gift given by God to be enjoyed according to his word. The good food that we eat, the music that we listen to, the artwork that we view, the car that we drive with the windows down, praise God for the temperatures, right? The shoes that we wear as we run down the greenway path, the fishing rod and reel we fish with are gifts by God to be enjoyed, not to control us, right? But to be enjoyed. It means you can eat, drink, work, have fun, and not let those things be an idol in your life, right? Paul, again, writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, says this, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. Don't think you're better than those who don't have as much means as you, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. In other words, don't put your security and identity in what you have, but what? But on God who richly provides us with everything to what? To enjoy. Can you think of an example from your life where you felt that if you just had that one thing, you would have joy, only to get it, and guess what? Have no joy at all. Can you think of something you had that didn't bring you joy because you lacked the proper perspective, but when God gave you a different perspective with that thing, now you have joy in it. God gives us the ability and the power to enjoy the things that he gives us can you think of reasons why God isn't giving you the ability to enjoy the things that you have? Is it possible that your worship of the Lord is out of line? Is it possible that you are leaning more toward the misery of greed and not the joy of God's provisions? I encourage you to spend time with the Lord. The last thing that Solomon talks about, that how we receive joy, is God reminds us to enjoy him above all else. You see, the greater issue is not whether you have wealth or not. The greater issue is whether or not you are worshiping the Lord with what you have. Remember, you cannot serve two masters. Wealth cannot take the place of God. That's why we should always worship the giver and not the gifts. Notice one of the blessings that comes from this in verse 20. Solomon says, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. What an awesome phrase. The word occupied is the same word for affliction in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 13. God given joy is the answer to the afflictions that we will experience in this life. By the grace of God, he busies our hearts continuously with the goodness of his joy. Praise be to God for that. I don't know about you, but I love being busied and occupied by the joy of the Lord. God overwhelms the heart with joy. There is peace and joy to be had because our greatest wealth isn't what we have or what we can attain. Our greatest wealth is knowing him as our savior. Would you rather be occupied with the misery that comes from greed Darkness, vexation, sickness, or anger, or the joy of the Lord. Your greatest riches are found in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 6, 6-10 six says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these things, we will be content. So the basic necessities of life. But those who desire, those who are greedy to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into a trap, into many senseless and harmless desire, harmful desires that plunge uh, people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 
You see, contentment isn't found in how much you have or how little you have. Contentment is found when you trust in the Lord and steward what he has given to you for his glory. British pastor Charles Simeon says this. He says, there are but two lessons for the Christian to learn. One is to enjoy God in everything, and two is to enjoy everything in God. Jesus writes in Matthew 6, 19, 21, do not lay up for tre- uh, yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven whether neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you truly investing in today? Is it the temporal things of life or the things that have eternal impact? The true character of your heart, actions and thoughts will indicate where your true investment is given. Do you treasure Jesus Christ every day? When the Apostle Paul talks about a portion of his testimony in Philippians 3, he says in verse 7, whatever gain I had, and the gain that he's talking about in those previous verses, he talks about how awesome his family heritage was, his biblical knowledge was, his religious activity, his moral lifestyle, the social status that he had in that community. He says, I I count all that up. Whatever gain I had, I count it as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. The joy of putting God first in all things mean you will be satisfied even in the little things. The joy of sharing his provisions with others, what an amazing opportunity to be reminded that there are certain things that money just cannot buy. Where are you experiencing the misery of greed? And where would you like to experience the joy of God's provision? Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 2 says this, and this is the great invitation for us this morning. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me, eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Have you received that invitation this morning? I encourage you, find your ultimate satisfaction. What you treasure most be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The price has already been paid. It has been paid in full and has been given to us by God's grace to enjoy forever. Do you hunger for him? Is he where your ultimate satisfaction is? Do you find yourself with restless nights? Do you find yourselves trying to be satisfied in things that just will never satisfy? Let it be a wake-up call to your soul that maybe you're leaning more towards the greediness of wealth and not the joys of the provisions that God has given to you. Are you experiencing today some of those joys? The ability to share that with others. The ability to enjoy what God has given to you. And greatly, most importantly, the joy of treasuring him above all else. As the worship team comes and leads us in our time of response, I want to give everyone an opportunity to spend time with the Lord, to come before the Lord and just be reminded that wealth in and of itself is not evil, but there is a seductive nature to it. Are you falling into those temptations? Are you turning a blessing that God has provided by his grace into an idol that brings about misery? I pray that as you spend time with the Lord this morning, that you will have a healthy dose of confession and repentance and renewed trust in the finished work of Christ. The altar will be open for you. You can come pray. Uh, I'd love to pray with you if that's a decision you would like to make. But at the end of the day, this is between you and the Lord. So however the Lord is making you sensitive today, give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Let us sing to the Lord.
There is light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. We turn our eyes, we turn our eyes, see the darkness bow to light. Let's overcome the night. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us and no power has dominion For more than conquerors we are We turn our eyes, we turn our eyes See the darkness bow to light And we will rise Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In the light of His glory and grace. In the light of His glory and grace, we turn our eyes, we turn our eyes, see the darkness bow to light, and we will rise, and we His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Well, praise the Lord. The meddling of the word of the Lord is a difficult thing. But it is a very gracious thing. And I pray that you spend time with the Lord this week and just really have an honest evaluation of your priorities in life, where your true satisfaction is found. And you can have great possessions, great generosity, great joy. This is not about prosperity gospel. 
This is about being content with the provision that God has put before you. If it be your gift, your possessions, the opportunities that you have been given, is it for the glory of the Lord and for the good of those around you? We'd love to connect with you. If you're on campus, we have a next up area in our, to your left in our main gathering area. That would be a great place to lift up prayer requests. And, and maybe uh, there's some, we, some great resources for maybe some financial assistance as far as how to better budget and things like that. We'd love to get those resources to you. Uh, if you're joining with us online, we'd like to extend that same uh, opportunity for you as well. So fill out one of those connection cards. So uh, as we uh, prepare to close in prayer, I do want to bring two uh, announcements to you this morning. Uh, one is to affirm new members. We have Trent and Larissa Latham and uh, Gislaine Tora, who have uh, graciously uh, felt the Lord call them to be at fellowship here at Charleston Baptist Church, and, and we're so thankful to have them. What an amazing uh, family, and uh, I would just like for us to affirm them by saying amen. 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 Praise be to God. And then lastly, next Saturday, uh, April the 20th at 10 a.m., we're going to have our uh, seasons, uh, ladies, or seasons uh, ladies Ministry has a brunch uh, next Saturday at 10 a.m. It'll be in our gym building, so right directly behind you. If you've not already registered for that, please do so as quickly as you can because it helps with just preparations and things like that. You can go to our Next Step area again to your left. You can register online. If you need help doing that, please let us know. We'd love for you to be there. It's for all ages of ladies, uh, so please not only come, but also invite someone to come with you. It'll be an am amazing time of just fellowship with uh, women of God and just uh, spending time praising the Lord and, and being very thankful for all the Lord is doing. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, let us close in prayer. Lord, again, thank you so much uh, for your grace and your mercy to us. Uh, Lord, there's a reason why Jesus talks so much about money. The seductive nature and the false security that comes from possessions and wealth is destroying families, Christian families. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would be reminded that there is a great gift in simplicity. Uh, there is a great gift of joy to be generous, a great gift of joy to, to be able to just enjoy the provisions that you've given to us. Not to complain about the things that we do not have or to spend our time wishing we had other things, but just to enjoy the season that you have us in today. And Lord, I pray that our greatest joy is always the giver and not the gift. So Lord, where we have gone astray, where our hearts and minds have wandered from that beautiful truth, Lord, let us return to you in confession, repentance, and renew trust in the finished work of Christ. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a blessed day.